Hello, my friends. Uh, this is Logan Jacob. Welcome back to my channel. Today, I am very excited. Uh, we have something new for the channel. Uh, hopefully, this will be the first of many. I want to start a series where we interview app developers and iOS musicians and specifically people working within iOS. I don't think there's enough content about that out there. And uh, we definitely need to shine the spotlight on some of the folks creating some of the great apps that we use every day. My first guest today, uh, the first person to respond to me on Facebook Messenger when I reached out to him, uh, is well known in the iOS app community. He developed glitch breaks for iOS years ago, several years ago, on back on his iPhone 3G, and most recently has released Glitchcore, which was recently the number one music making app on the App Store. He is coming to us from Tampa, Florida. Uh, we're very excited to have Alex Matthew with us. Alex, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Well, like I said, we're real excited and uh, Glitchcore is such a fantastic app and I think we need to shine the spotlight on you and uh, let you tell your story a little bit and, and tell us what you've got going on and how you got to where we are. So first off, thank you for developing such a great app for us to play with. Oh, absolutely. It was, it was a quite a fantastic journey to, to develop it. And I had excellent beta testers to help me uh, test every piece of it and give me new ideas as we were going through the beta. So that's great. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, we're, uh, we're definitely looking forward to updates and, but it, I mean, it's already a fantastic app. I think I told you that on Facebook the other day, it's, it's fantastic as it is, but the, the little secret stuff that you told me about what's coming up soon was, uh, was really cool. Really excited. I do want to mention that, um, Alex did an interview with Nutrix, the synth guy, uh, last week or a couple weeks ago. And that video just went live a few days ago. I'm going to post a link to that video, uh, in the comments here and, uh, on the YouTube or in, in the description. Um, I'm trying to keep it a little bit different from that one. So I encourage you to go check out that interview. It was an excellent interview and Alex did a really good job of demoing some of the functionality of Glitchcore and showing us some of the cool stuff we could do. I actually, as soon as I finished it, pulled up Glitchcore and started playing around with stuff and using some of his ideas from that. Um, so it's a great, great uh, interview. You should definitely go and check that out. But for mine, Alex, what I want to do, uh, I want to kind of start off just learning a little bit about you and how you got here. So, uh, you know, just tell us your story. What was, uh, when did you get into music and how did you decide to, to get where you are today? Well, as far as getting into music, so I've had a musical background uh, most of my life. My dad, he's a concert pianist. And of course, growing up, you know, I, to rebel, I, I took to guitar instead of piano. So, uh, and I started... I think when I was probably about 12 or so, started playing guitar and really getting into uh, some of the bands I was listening to and trying to emulate the sort of sound that they had. But, but what really did it for me is uh, I had early on gotten uh, a Commodore Amiga. I'm mean, sorry, a Commodore 64. That was my first computer. Uh, later, I got the Amiga. But some of the uh, video game music that was going on, I wanted to see how that was made. So I, I downloaded... Uh, or actually, I don't think I downloaded. I think I you know, ended up buying it at the store on the big <laughs> five and a quarter inch floppy disk, right? But I, I got uh, uh, just the most basic of of sound uh, making tools on it. So there was like an audio editor, and then there was a, a little sort of MIDI studio type thing. I don't, I'm not even sure if it was quite MIDI then then at the time, but that got me interested in mixing uh, electronic music and uh, guitar. Right? So it evolved as I, as I kept going. Uh, I got a Commodore Amiga and that was like the huge step because it, was, it had the sampler on it and I could uh, actually sample things. I got into trackers and I could, I could start making stuff. And of course it was only, I think it was 8-bit audio and then I got an expansion card that let me make 12-bit audio. I know I'm dating myself, but I, it, <laughs> I could make 12-bit audio with it and I was so excited. But then later I, I realized, you know, I, you know, I want to make CD quality stuff. So I ended up going out and buying a uh, Fostex uh, tape, uh, four-track tape recorder and got my Alesis drum machine. So I was, I was using my guitar, I was using samples from um, the Amiga and sort of mixing it all together, had started a few bands here and there. And that's really where I got my musical start. I just started, uh, you know, making, making music, making tracks with that. Actually, later on, I sort of phased guitar out of it, but uh, I still play guitar. I just, it's not really prevalent in my music, but 
I, I met a few people that were using uh, more synthesizers and hardware and stuff. So I, I bought a sampler. It was a uh, uh, ASR 10 and that I, I used that thing to make several albums. Uh, and then I started buying, you know, like we all do outboard synths. I, I bought a couple uh, just rack units and would play them with that. And that was really my start. I think it was, uh, 1997 or so when I put out my first album. So I uh, put out an album and then picked up a little recognition, got, uh, got a label excited about it. And they signed me, uh, to a, a label in Canada called Gashed. And it was my first musical project back then called Negative Format. And, uh, so I made an album with them It ended up getting, uh, distributed over in Europe and a, a label over in Europe picked it up uh, and that label was a uh, Zothomog and now this is very niche sort of music because it was like industrial uh, kind of aggro uh, not really rock because I, I was sort of out of the rock phase of my music making and into like the industrial like hard beats and stuff uh, but they picked it up and it did pretty well and it started playing shows everywhere and that was really what launched my musical journey uh, I've since then been on several different labels uh now the so the last full album that i put out for this project was quite a while ago it was uh 2008 my sound kind of changed into more uh dance floor sort of trance type stuff and but so i, I just want i don't want to sit there and talk <laughs> about every single thing i did with, with that but i did have uh, a side project and i was always really into uh, like glitchy drum and bass and like a sort of ambient sort of just experimental stuff that was coming out back then. Uh, I've really admired people like Aphex Twin, but in the, in the industrial genre, there was, there was one artist in particular named How Job and they, uh, so he was just making all kinds of wild noises and uh, using samples in this stuff and making this just really uh, music that just spoke to me specifically. So, uh, I, I started uh, kind of veering off the uh, industrial sort of path and going drum and bass. And that's what got me to uh, really into some of the more uh, glitchy experimental stuff and why I ended up making uh, glitch breaks to begin with. So, but cool. I mean, that's, that's really my musical <laughs> background. Uh, cool. So you have, you have experience as a, as a touring musician, as a, uh, I guess kind of EDM, would you call it EDM or, yeah. or I, I don't know all the terms for electronic music very well yet. So. Yeah, it's pretty niche. I mean, it does sort of fall into EDM. EDM is more like trance is, would be considered EDM, but uh, this actually was called the biggest term for it was EBM electronic body music. Oh. Uh, so uh, like some of my big influences, obviously, I mentioned how job, but like front two, four, two, that was like, they're like the pioneers of electronic body music. And uh, it's like some of the stuff that's coming out of Europe, like Belgium. Uh, I, I know how job was from Germany. So that, those were my early like electronic music influences. Obviously that changed and stuff um, as, as I kept going. So what were those gigs like? Uh, is that, you know, is this a setup where you set up kind of like a producer DJ set and, and do your own live thing? Or are you primarily in, in clubs for dancing or setting up in bars or, or how do you, how was that going? Well, so it's, it's like your typical bar. I mean, it's like a typical bar club. It, it, it depends on the show. So I played in, uh, so I didn't really do a full tour ever. It was always sort of one-off shows because I was still working, still had a day job and still, uh, so it was really hard to, try to get, you know, leave and tour for a month. But it was uh, a promoter would uh, get a hold of me and uh, fly me out to wherever. Uh, I played all over the country in the U.S. here. Also ended up playing uh, in Germany a couple times and played in Canada once. So got to really have like sort of vacations because <laughs> my <laughs> wife would go along with me and we, you know, sort of make a vacation out of it and then play the show. But it was... Typical venues were, uh, you know, fit would like maybe 500 people, a thousand people max in the venues sort of thing. Uh, but so it was a little bigger than the bar, but not quite like huge uh, place, more like a, a theater, I guess, because there's a couple of places that were called theaters. Uh, but as far as the setup, it was you know me with, uh, and I had a couple bandmates that would help out, but it, it was, we'd have synthesizers and usually I'd bring a computer. I I'm a 
long time Ableton Live user. Mm -hmm. So we would run the, the live set with live back then. This is all before iPad was even a twinkle in anybody's eye or <laughs> iOS really wasn't out back then. But, but yeah, I would uh, bring the rig as far as running it basically off a laptop early, early on before I, it was viable to really run it off a laptop. And it'd, it'd be a lot of the backing tracks were either on mini disc or um, uh, drum machines. We'd have drum machines that we'd just program in with backing tracks, uh, have someone playing synths. And then I, I would do some vocals too. So, and later on, as we, uh, as I, experimented with adding extra band members uh, had uh, my best friend he was uh, he would play out with me and his wife actually was sing she sang on a, a few of the records so it was a better dynamic than than she could be out front singing while uh, we were playing a lot of the sins as we kept going with lot uh, Ableton live it was a lot of triggering a bunch of different parts you could then uh, control like how that song is going to go not really like a DJ, but you're you're playing synth parts and then triggering other parts as you go. So it's similar to like what you would do. Uh, uh, Why well, in live you do, like? Have you ever used Launchpad on on mm -hmm. iPad or in, anything where you're triggering clips like that? Sure. So you would do that in live, and then you could also then play uh, synth parts over that. Um, and of course, if you had any uh, any live elements, like uh, sometimes we'd have. Uh, uh, some drums set up like drum pads set up and it, just for extra stuff, you know, extra dynamic things during the shows. But yeah. Cool. Uh, so yeah, just typical electronic industrial sort of sets that we did back then. That's really interesting. So I, uh, my history uh, a little bit, I, I don't want to focus on me, but I, I played in garage bands in, uh, in high school and college became a jazz musician in college. Uh, I was still working on electronic music, but I was uh, a music major. So I was in that kind of academic music, uh, electronic world. So Steve Reich and John Cage and, and all of that weird stuff. Um, so the only performances I ever did with electronic music were academic performances. There were recitals, you know, composition recitals. And I never took it out into bars or, or out performing in that kind of venue before. And um, now that I've gotten back into that uh, over the last few months, I've, I've been curious how you would do that. Of course, I'm, I'm in the middle of Arkansas. Um, and uh, there's not a whole lot of uh, electronic music here. We do have a few like EDM festivals. We have a place called Mulberry Mountain that's pretty popular um, for that kind of thing. But I don't really make electronic dance music either. So I, there's, we have a, a venue for garage bands downtown called Vino's. And I can't even imagine taking my Eurorack and iPad and synths into, into Vino's and trying to play. They would laugh me off the stage. Um, so I'm, I'm really curious. Uh, I thought that was really interesting to, to hear how you would do that kind of a set as a live musician. That's really cool. Well, for, for my side project, and this is after I, uh, so I, I played out a couple times before I had developed Glitch Breaks, but after I developed Glitch Breaks, uh, and that's really what got me to make Glitch Breaks is to make something where I could juggle break beats and cut them and glitch them easily. And it, it I used it as a performance tool. So I did play a few shows where I was using Glitch Breaks on an iPad and also, uh, uh, running uh, a launch, Novation Launchpad to launch all my clips as I was playing uh, with Glitch Breaks on the iPad, and that was that was me by myself doing shows like that as uh, as my moniker Distraub. So it was more experimental, glitchy sort of ambient drum and bass kind of thing, and. And yeah, I, sometimes I did play to some crowds that just didn't get it, right? Yeah. So they just, they necessarily weren't into that, but I, maybe I was opening up for another band that was uh, more uh, like uh, electro or industrial or something like that. And I would open up for them. So some of the people were just kind of, yeah, yeah. And just, you know, but I played to all sorts of different crowds from uh, really packed places to, so I find that all over the country, everybody just responds differently so you, you can see like we have the tampa crowd even if they're really liking it they they don't move uh, and really get into it as like some other places i know when i played up in canada i played up in montreal they, they just went insane crazy i mean as as soon as we dropped in the first halftime beat the whole the, the entire place just went bananas and it was, it was <laughs> really awesome. it was it was really cool. I mean, it was really a nice experience, but, but yeah. Uh, so playing with electronic music, it, it's, it's really easy to fall into that trap where, okay, you, people just see you as a guy who's going to go up there and just hit 
play and mm-hmm. you're just going to uh, do your thing. But it depends on how much you get into the show, what you're doing, what, what they see you doing and, and you sort of transfer that energy to the crowd. That's what, that's what it's all about. Right. So, mm-hmm. and Pretty even cool. if it's, I say, even if it's, you know, you're triggering a bunch of things with, with Ableton live, uh, how you're triggering them and they can feel that energy and how stuff is changing. They, they catch on to that. So. Cool. So that was all just kind of side project for you because you're not, I mean, you're a professional musician, but that's not your, I guess, quote unquote main gig. So tell us what, what, what do you do day to day for what's your nine to five? My nine to five. So I'm a software developer uh, for my nine to five. I, I work for a, a security. So I did for a long time uh, work as a network administrator for, for a really long time. And then during the end of that, I uh, got into software development. That was probably a good 15 years ago. <laughs> I got into software development and started doing a lot of that software development for them. And then at one point when I was making iOS apps on the side and doing all this stuff, I'm like, oh, well, I would really love to have iOS be my focus and my day job. So I, I went and found a job uh, working as an iOS developer uh, full time during the day. Well, I found that if you look at when that happened, it's really when uh, I had created glitch breaks, I had created sliver, and then I got that job. It was just taking so much of my focus and just taking everything, uh, pouring everything into iOS that at the end of the day, I just wasn't, it was, I was too busy and wasn't outputting what I needed to output in the evenings and to make these things happen. So mm-hmm. I'm still working for that same company, but we've transitioned and I'm not we're not doing iOS anymore. We're uh, doing security software. And so it sort of took best of both worlds because I was a network admin. I'm, I'm uh, doing uh, programming as a, a security software. So I get to really know all that network stuff again and, and get work all that in. But it's, you know, doing uh, like with Node backends and uh, a lot of JavaScript and stuff. So it's different enough now that I can make that separation and at, at night and on weekends, uh, get back into developing my iOS audio app. So cool. So that's perfect. You, you go from a touring electronic musician and doing that as your side gig and then start developing software for a living. And then you can just throw those two skills together. And that's, I guess where glitch breaks. So what, what year did glitch breaks? It was about 2012 or so. Yeah. 2012 that glitch breaks came out. Cool. So what led you, I know you talked a little bit about it with, uh, with new tricks or what it's, you, you mentioned earlier that uh, glitch breaks was kind of a, a way for you to, to solve a problem as a performer. Um, is that really what inspired you to develop it? Or did you start with, Hey, I need to develop an audio app. What do I want to do? Well, when I, when I first, uh, got it. So my wife actually got an iPhone first. And of course I was a a windows guy at the time when she got the iPhone and uh, she's like, Oh, I got the new iPhone. I'm like, ah, and finally I I started looking at like, Oh, this thing's really cool. And I, that was when the first iPhone three came out and you could actually develop applications for it. Cause I believe iPhone two, maybe you could for iPhone two, uh, but the first iPhone, it was locked and you couldn't Mm -hmm. develop anything for it. So then I started, I'm like, Oh, well, I'm a developer. I can learn this and start developing things for it. And it was right around the same time that we uh, had our, our first child. And uh, for my daughter, I'm like, oh, I want to make a educational app. And so, uh, of course, the first app that I made, it was, uh, you know, make sound. And so it was guessing animal, like getting her to like, it would show like an animal quiz and it would show uh, animals and they would pick which animal is making that sound for, mm-hmm. for babies. Right. So yeah. that, that really got my feet wet. And then of course the whole time I'm like, Oh, well, I'm a musician. I would love to at one point develop an audio app, but I didn't have a certain, like I, I didn't have the exact idea what I wanted to develop. And then that's when I, I had been making uh experimental drum and bass glitchy drum and bass and found the process of creating those cuts and glitches and uh juggling those break beats really tedious because i was manually doing it in ableton live and Mm -hmm. you can imagine just cutting all of them up and uh so i wanted to be able to perform that on the fly and what i'm doing just hit record and be able to have that for my track and that's where the focus that's how i i basically focus tested for myself as i, I kept doing it okay can i make this uh 
work with my workflow. When I got to that point, I felt that I was in a pretty good spot and then I polished it. I know that frustration that you were talking about for sure of the cutting manually back in when I was in high school, I had cakewalk uh, by sonar and wanted to, to chop up, uh, you know, like documentaries and, and spoken word stuff and chop it up. And, you know, I was a Steve Reich fan, so it was, I, I wanted to do, it's going to rain, you know, something like that. And uh, chopping all that stuff manually, man, <laughs> it was especially on a, you know, 2005 Dell tower computer with a CRT monitor. It was just not, not, not fun at all. Certainly not as fun as a, uh, as glitch core is. So um, I have not played with glitch breaks uh, yet, unfortunately, but um, I know that you took some of those ideas. So you went from, from glitch breaks uh, back in 2012 and fast forward to eight years later, um, you start working on glitch core and what, what led you to that? So the, so the reason I called it glitch core is because it's, it's really the core mechanics of glitch breaks, uh, but applied to an audio effect. So what it does, like in a nutshell, is it takes uh, a buffer of, of, of audio as you're piping whatever you want through that channel and, and takes that buffer and then manipulates that buffer. So y you can loop it, you can uh, resequence it, you can uh, uh, micro glitch it. That's what, it, so it's those like tiny, tiny micro loops that, that sound all glitchy. Those, that's what, where the glitch uh, comes from. So, and uh, that's what glitch breaks did, but glitch breaks did it as a generator. So as you loaded in uh, samples in each channel, and glitch breaks had four channels that you could load a, a uh, break beat, and it's typically used for break beats. You could load whatever you wanted into it, but it's typically used for break beats, right? So you would load your four break beats, and at that point, you're playing each channel is like a pad, and as you play one, it would uh, exclusively solo that one, so it juggles them back and forth. And then uh, you have controls to where you could glitch a portion of it or cut it different ways. So those core mechanics of glitching, cutting, uh, it didn't really have the, so it had cutting, but it, it just wasn't as uh, comprehensive of, of, it didn't have like a full pattern sequencer mm -hmm. built into it. It just had what I called a cut editor. So it would be, what I mean by cuts is that each uh, portion of the sound, you just decide where it starts and ends. And as, as it goes through and it's playing that entire sound across, it'll jump to those cuts and play those. So it's in a way sequencing, but with an actual pattern editor, it lets you do it more naturally. And that was what I sort of developed into Glitch Core as I took it, the idea a little further. But the core difference being that it's an audio effect and can do it on anything at all, right? On anything, yeah. That's really yeah. cool. I, in your uh, interview with Nutrix, when you did the full demo and you had um, uh, Fugue Machine, which uh, anybody that's familiar with my channel knows that I'm a huge Fugue Machine fan. Um, the uh, Going into the Bleas Alpha synthesizer, I think, and you were cutting that up on the fly and uh, th that was just really great. Um, and then I think later on you took a uh, an audio a file from file player and started cutting that up and i think that's really the beauty of glitch core is you can use it for so many different applications um you know as somebody that's that's been into musica concrete and and stuff like that being able to take an audio file and and make it rhythmic on the fly is is very very interesting to me but then i also love throwing a drum beat in it and uh and creating those kind of break beats i mean it's it's really brilliant so I want to talk a little bit about the um, process of developing an, uh, an audio unit for iPad. You know, this is a fairly new technology, um, and there doesn't seem to be just a whole lot of information out there. Um, you mentioned when we were talking earlier about um, developing for core audio and that there was really virtually no information out there, and you just kind of had to... to lean on a few other people that were doing it. Um, and I think there's a lot of developers that are doing that now with uh, audio units. So for developing, uh, and now I'm not a developer, I, I have a music degree. So you feel free to talk as technical as you want to the developer people. I'm not going to understand it. But um, as far as going from developing an app as opposed to developing an audio unit, what was the difference? And has the audio unit world made it a little bit easier to be able to get into that kind of development? 
Well, so the biggest challenge for me anyway, uh, with uh, a standalone app versus an audio unit is that in order to get it up and running, to get that audio unit to compile and, and uh, work right off the bat, that documentation just wasn't there uh, with easy to understand uh, like templates to say, okay, so you load this up, you can get it going. So Apple has, uh, they've released like a demo project, but I had the most terrible time trying to get that demo project to actually compile and work properly. And I think that was the biggest like uh, stumbling block for me is to get that that compiled and worked and get everything works because it's three three languages that I ended up uh, using to make my audio unit. So it's a Swift as the uh, front end mm -hmm. and then Objective C as the actual audio unit itself. And then all the DSP that I uh, do behind the scenes is I do that in C++. So getting all those languages to compile correctly and not get any compiler errors and that, so that was the biggest stumbling block as far as, uh, uh, like a new developer diving into it, there are there are a couple of resources that that really uh, help me get past those things. And one of them being uh, uh, Gene Delisa. He he had written some blog posts that like that in a like plain language sort of way just walked you through you know basically like don't be scared, just do this, <laughs> and 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 just walked you through every little portion of of getting you to a place where it actually would compile for you. Uh, and then uh, Bram Bose, he had put mm -hmm. in some of that same uh, same sort of information out there. And then, of course, uh, I think I think you pronounce it Honatan, but Jonathan, I was calling Jonathan <laughs> uh, from uh, Kymatica, uh, the uh, developer who makes AUM. He has a Dev Notes uh, section that'll uh, now it's meant so you can easily integrate with AUM, but it does have a lot of good information for creating audio units as well. Uh, but my my uh, biggest liberating factor of making uh, an audio unit like an and specifically an audio unit effect was that a uh, standalone app you have to worry about connectivity you have to worry about uh, the file system you just have to worry about all these extra things that if you make a focused little plug-in that you don't really have to worry about those things so once you get that up and running hardest part it, save it and make sure you have a, a good template for yourself and then uh then just worry about the uh signal the audio signal passing through and affecting that signal and doing what you need to do as a self-contained audio unit cool well, that's really cool. That's a, it's definitely a field that I would love to get into. My brother is a software developer and uh, I've been trying to hound him to, to teach me some of this stuff, but uh, you know, I've, I've dabbled in it and attempted to, but I, I think one of these days I might uh, start looking at an AU, but I mean, honestly, there's so much stuff coming out right now. Every time I have an idea for something, it turns out it's already there. So I don't have to worry about it. <laughs> I'll just go and get somebody else's. I would much rather pay people like you to <laughs> develop something great rather than me create something that's awful and only halfway does what I want it to do. <laughs> so, and you mentioned, uh, both Bram and, uh, Jonathan, I am hoping to be future guests. Uh, we'll see. I've, I'm working on compiling a list and reaching out to some of those folks and, uh, I, you know, pillars of the, of the iOS app, you know, music community. Um, we'd love to hear from them for sure. So, um, that's great. Cool. So, uh, I'm scrolling through the, uh, the questions that we kind of went over here. Okay. So, Going to Glitchcore, so Glitchcore comes out, it's become hugely popular just in the last what month or two that it's been out. Um, it was the number one music app for a little while, which is super cool. Um, and you know, it, your demos with Nutrix, uh, you showed us a lot of the, the kind of core functionality and, and how to, the cool stuff to do with it. What I wanted to ask you is, is there, is there, really, is there really any secret tech? Is there just something that, the average user may not be, and you've seen videos of people using your app. Is there something that, that goes in your mind? You're thinking, you know, if they just did this, you get a whole new, you know, idea going or something um, that you can share with us to check out. Well, I think for the first part is that getting that across to some people of, of what it is, it can be challenging because uh, people look at it, they see a waveform 
and they see, uh, you know, something running through it and they see a sequencer and manipulating it and doing this. And a lot of people think, oh, that that's generating the audio. You're using a sample to do that. It's just mm -hmm. that, that first, hey, this is an effect and you can use this on virtually anything that you pipe through. In fact, you could use it if you hit stop on uh, AUM and just leave it in a channel with uh, no sync to the host, but it'll, it'll sit and run based on the channel's audio. So you could hook a mic to it and you can start talking through it and still affect your voice as you're talking through it. Uh, you could also use the, there's a little freeze function in it. That's a, like a little snowflake. You just hit that snowflake and it'll grab, since it, it, it works on a, uh, one bar of audio, it'll mm -hmm. grab the last thing that you said for a bar and then you're, looping or, or manipulating that and you don't have to say anything so just one of the cool things that i see is people are starting to use that functionality and i never really intended it but they're using it like kind of like a live looper mm -hmm. so I, I know that it didn't really have all the features of a live looper but people tell me hey i can use this thing to uh, to live loop as I play and they'll play a part and, and hit freeze and then start messing with that part and play the next part and freeze that. So that's what was really cool for me to see different ways people use it. But really the, the magic of it is, is that buffer and being able to uh, keep writing over cyclically in the buffer and being able to basically resequence what, you would think is like the future because <laughs> it's it's not really because but it's you, you you feel like especially if you're pumping in something that's a loop you, you feel like you're changing the future because it's it's got what's already in the buffer and if it's loop then you can uh, rearrange those parts on the fly yeah and it's one of the great things about it being an effect is that you could open it up as a receive channel as a bus channel and you could bus several different things into it and uh, and start you know, messing around and, and glitching out, you know, all of your stuff at once through one uh, instance of, of glitch core, whether it's, you know, samples or, uh, you know, a drum, drum and bass going in there at the same time or something coming from a synthesizer. And that's, that's super cool. Something I, did, I hadn't thought about that, that you just inspired the talking into a microphone um, or, or singing or beatboxing or rapping or whatever you want to do into a microphone and, and glitching it on the fly. That's super cool. Um, I collaborate with a friend of mine who is the best tenor saxophonist that I personally know is incredible uh, musician named Brandon Doris. He's got a few YouTube videos up, um, but he's also really into electronic stuff. And, you know, it would be really cool to be able to, to pipe in his audio so that he's creating either, playing his sax or his iwi or, or using uh, his synthesizers and then me editing it and, and messing with it in glitch core. I mean, that, that sounds like something that would be a lot of fun to do live, especially. Yeah. That sounds pretty amazing. Yeah. Very cool stuff. Okay. So um, I know you have some secret projects that you're not ready to announce yet. Um, can you tell us anything about what's coming to glitch core that, uh, that you might be working on or, uh, even just a, a vague idea of some future apps, not that you're currently developing or something that, you know, if I ever get around to it, I'd like to develop something that does this. Sure. Uh, so for glitch core, uh, I, I, I really want to expand some of the, uh, the things in the, in the actual step sequencer itself. Uh, so one of the things I'm working on right now is uh, to have amplitude per step. So right now it's, it's the same amplitude. You can't really change that amplitude, but to be able to change those volumes for every step would just let you have more dynamic uh, sequences as you, as you edit them. Another, another thing that I know a lot of people asked for going in and I sort of ran out of time. What, when I was in beta, actually people started asking for would be uh to have it so it syncs to the host right now, but it it only allows you to do uh, uh, just sixteenths. Uh, it's one bar and sixteenth notes, so it's really locked into a four four sort of time. But to pick up a uh, a uh, the host's uh, time signature and use that time signature to split those uh, divisions of the steps up. So that's one big thing. And then of course to have longer than one bar. So mm -hmm. I've got that. I'm working on that as well. To I, so I do want to limit it because uh, I, I tested it with uh, up to four bars, and what'll happen is your your uh, 
buffer is so long that you're if you start messing with it at this end you have a lot of audio to get through so mm-hmm. it starts breaking the uh the magic a little bit uh if it's too long but I, i'm i'm thinking about doing one to four bars so to let you set that and uh play with it as well so those are like some of the things I, I would love to get, and this would probably be as a, a later update. Not now, I'm onto my wish list, but I would love to get envelopes uh, for each step, so to have different types of envelopes. The biggest thing that's stopping me on the per step stuff is to try to think of what the UI will look like for that, because I, it is easy to use and people love the interface, and I, I just don't want to make the wrong move and clutter it and put a ton of buttons everywhere where mm-hmm. you can't figure out what's going on or making everything like hidden, <laughs> that sort of thing. So I, I want it to be intuitive in a way that you can change those settings per step in an easy way without uh, hindering your current workflow. So. Now, since it is an AU, um, especially with AUM, one of the things that I love about it is that you can treat it almost kind of like modular where you can run uh, MIDI sequencers, you can run um, LFOs and things like that into the apps. Um, what are some of the ways that you can control uh, Glitch Core from, you know, something else? And if you want to pull it up uh, you, we, and show us some of the little features, sure. you, you absolutely can. I know yeah, I'm let me go ahead. you on the fly. So <laughs> uh, no problem. Yeah. Let me just go ahead and pull it up. I just have to share my screen over here. Oh, okay. Now that I have it loaded up, uh, I just wanted to quick uh, show you the AU parameter list. So glitch core is here and let me just, well, another quick nice thing about um, the interface is that it's, fully dynamic for, as you can see, when, when I'm moving it around, it'll resize to whatever shape you want to size it to. So if you want to get more, uh, more of these on the screen at once. And that's something I like to do is put several glitch cores on different channels and have them uh, small like this so you can control them all at once. Mm-hmm. But uh, all of the parameters, the AU parameters, uh, I exposed. So if you set MIDI control up for this channel, and I happen to have it on the one that has uh, alpha on it, and then you go down to glitch core where it says parameters here, and then you can start seeing that pretty much everything in the app, I think the only parameters that I don't have exposed are for copy and clear pattern because they didn't really make as much sense, but everything else, uh, including the some of the move tools, uh, so like this this guy is exposed. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to close that. Started touching that somewhere else. Let's get that open again. So to to control something in here, you would just uh, assign it uh, to a. Uh, either a MIDI controller or uh, you can assign it to another app. Uh, so if you have something like uh, Rosetta or uh, anything in the Rosetta suite and you wanted to uh, send uh, changes to like Rosetta LFO and, and change some of the uh, grid locations. So each, each grid slice itself, you can see it says grid one through 16 there, each grid slice you can control with an LFO. So it's pretty cool. You could just set one of these up and then you would just MIDI learn it uh, for your controller. Now I don't have a controller, uh, MIDI controller hooked up to this iPad at the moment, so I can't quickly show you that, but I do I think I have a project where I did have, and I don't. <laughs> Sorry about that. I had well, that gives me an I idea for LFOs future videos, so I'll to, uh... to map up there. Um, but I can show. A, let me just quickly load up Rosetta, and this may take me a second. So you may want to cut <laughs> just a little bit out so we don't bore everybody. And I'm in the wrong section. There we go. I do that every single time. I know it's you see MIDI right away and you mm-hmm. go straight to the MIDI you use. I, I do the same thing, but okay, let me just load up Rosetta and load it up. And I know so one thing I would love to get if Jonathan can figure this out <laughs> would be to be able to uh have a controller out here and if it's you know, whatever kind of controller and leave this window open. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
because then you could learn and say MIDI learn and then hit a key over, hit a button on this guy, on this guy over here while that window's open. But as soon as you touch the screen on that side, it goes away. So there is a workaround with Rosetta oh. that I use. Um, you can actually just turn it on and like deactivate two of the LFOs and only leave on the one uh, you're right. controlling. And uh, it'll read that uh, as run. You have to hit play to get the LFO actually running. Sure. Yeah, but uh, yeah. when you hit learn, it will actually grab that. Okay. Oh, nice. Yeah. I, you know, I didn't even think about that. So let me do that. And let me just make sure I hit the right one here. See, I'm learning stuff as we go. That, that totally makes sense. So let me just set this up to be grid slice one. Now, here. I don't think you have the LFO is not set to, to control oh, to the, output. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. You're right. So let me, and go to that guy. And slice one. Now it should, there we go. See, it's already jumping up and down. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, so I guess then if we go back here and deactivate this one and activate this one, then we could just do it for another slice. I guess it doesn't have to be two. It could be another slice, right? Um, Let's do it for, I don't know, slice nine. And yeah, as somebody that's into Eurorack modular stuff, uh, this is perfect. I mean, this is essentially modular. Okay. You're you're controlling um, each you know effect with another effect, and it's it's beautiful. And I, I was giddy every time I open uh, the parameters on a new effect and I see a long list like you have there uh, I just get super excited uh, there's so much stuff that you can play with um, yeah axon 2 is another one that that you can just mess with a million parameters on it and I, I absolutely love that uh, you know it makes me wish that I had you know 15 LFOs in in one app so that I could uh, send them all different directions so you can see I, I slowed down the LFO on, on one and then I have this guy setting it up and then as you, as you then play that, I'm sure that'll sound crazy. <laughs> so now if we, maybe it won't sound that crazy because it's changing just a little bit when it goes on the LFO. But I, yeah, I had, I had a, I had, I think, uh, so 16 different LFOs, Rosetta piping all 16 of them. And this was for testing because it was kind of crazy. But I had the whole thing flying up and down. And it was pretty cool because it was uh, making basically a generative uh, sort of ambient piece for me on the fly as I just piped things through it. Um, yeah, and that is 100% my bag. So like I've, I've done that as well. Just piped as many LFOs into it as possible and, and let it go bananas. Um, I absolutely love it. That's great. I will ask, I do, I have two requests uh, sure. because we were going to get to that part of the, of the interview eventually where I start asking you for stuff, you know, because you haven't already put hours and hours of work into this. Um, so I would like to be able to control the X and Y with an LFO, if that makes sense. So that when you hold the glitch, you know, where you have your X, Y pad, where you touch it. I don't know if it's even possible uh, in an AU to do that, but um, to have a, a, an LFO controlling where the X and the Y are so that when you hit the, the glitch button, it changes, uh, if that, that makes sense. Is, is that something you can do? Is it it's just a label yeah, something that I don't know how to do it? So I just haven't spent enough time with it. It, it, it's, labeled, it's not labeled X and Y, but it, if you look here, there's glitch start and glitch end. Oh, that's effectively what they are. Um, yeah, so the glitch start itself will be the, uh, on the, in the buffer itself, mm -hmm. it'll be the start of your uh, loop uh, in that, or the start point of the loop in that buffer. And that's what you're controlling with the X. And then the glitch end is really the size of the, of that loop that you're controlling. And that's what you're controlling with the Y. So if you set those to the LFOs, um, let me put those LFOs back on. <laughs> so, uh, and I'll have to it's, take them uh, off the other one, right? So. Yeah, it's CC 13 and 15, if that helps to, <laughs> to do it quickly. I've, I've oh, yeah, I see so it, much yeah. that I have them memorized. 
So I'm just going to pretend like you added that feature specifically for me when I oh, asked. Sweet. Oh, sweet. Oh, absolutely. There the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> you called me that one day and I, you know, I, I added it in for you. So come to an interview so. for my channel so that you can <laughs> give me a how to on this app. Cause that's what. <laughs> okay. And it's going to, of course, yell at me because I have. Yeah, it's all right. You can leave one. it on there. It's, okay. Might as well have it doing multiple things. That's uh, oh, okay. All right. Well, that's what oh, makes yeah. generative music fun. And let me just, oh, I can't. Oh, <laughs> as soon as I, that's fine. Let me go back here and get back into this guy. And so we've taken it for him. We already took it for him. So I guess we'll put it back to grid slice one. There we go. And it's going to yell at us. That's okay. And for this one, uh, it's going to, it's the only drawback. It goes away. And then we'll turn that guy on, come over here, and get back in there to, and I clicked on the wrong thing. There we go. And we'll set up glitch end for that one and learn that. So now those LFOs should be controlling that. Actually, I'm not sure why that one's not. So that's, I got the up and down going. I'm not mm -hmm. sure what, oh, cause I don't have it on. There we go. There we go. There Perfect. We go. Look at that. Hey, yep. So now if you hit the glitch button and if you were to hit this guy here, there you go. Awesome. And so that's one like, slightly hidden hidden i would say hidden feature but uh it just expand this a little bit so if you're uh if you hit the glitch button itself it'll latch mm -hmm. and then if you then hit it again it'll unlatch but if you start your glitch uh by touching the xy pad it'll uh it won't latch so it'll be immediate as you touch it uh it so if you wanted to move this around what you do is then latch it then move this and then you let go and it keeps glitching and then you let go and it keeps glitching and then you can turn off. So it has two modes of, of working just depending on whether you hit the button or you hit the pad first. So sure. this is a quick, quick tip. <laughs> really cool. I like that. So I'm, I'm a fan of, uh, I told you I haven't used Ableton live too much, but one of the things that I, one of the reasons I used it a little bit is because I'm a huge fan of uh, BT and the uh, stutter edit effect that he created with isotope. Um, and it's, I, I love the way that you can glitch with stutter edit and that X, Y pad, the way that all that works reminds me a lot of stir, of stutter edit. Um, it's very unique and it does its own thing and I like that, but it, it was a way for me to be able to, to do what I was doing in stutter edit on the iPad, which is wonderful. Also, your app is three ninety nine, which is amazing. I mean, the, it's such a robust app. They do so much cool stuff with it. I, at that price, it's just unbeatable. I do have my other request, and you you kind of mentioned this earlier. You mentioned changing the uh, the length of the sequence based on the um, time signature uh, that you're working with in your DAW. Would it be possible to to manually change that as well? So if I'm you know if I'm in four four, but I wanted to have a five step sequence. Um, you know, to, to do some kind of polyrhythmic type glitch over the top of it, that would be something I would love to be able to see. And then of course, to be able to control that number uh, via CCs or, or MIDI or whatever. Yeah. So that, yes, definitely. I, uh, so I wasn't going to only have it uh, be able to change with the, uh, with the time signature of the host. It is one goal that I have, cause I keep getting asked about time signature of the host and it's, uh, Something that I initially wanted to get in there, it's just that it was going to delay it <laughs> quite sure. a while because there's a lot yeah. to do with it. But I do really want to be able to let you have control to uh, first uh, to change your divisions. Like say you wanted to say, okay, I want eighth notes. Oh, okay, I want quarter notes. Uh, and to, so that that's what becomes. And that should be relatively easy. There's some, there's, some of the uh, ways that I, uh, I'm storing that data for how you make your steps, that portion needs to change. So I just need to rework those portions. But as far as how uh, those loops get set up or how those steps themselves, which they're really just 
pointers in the in the buffer get set up. Uh, that's not the technical limitation. It's more the limitation of the, how the structure is set of how that information gets held. So, so yeah, I totally plan on that. What I would love to do, and I'm not sure like for if this is going to make that much sense from a UI perspective, would be able to have variable uh, glitch step lengths in the same uh, step. So you, you wouldn't say, oh, I want them all to be eighth notes. Oh, I want them all to be uh, uh, quarter notes or whole notes or whatever uh, that you would be able to then drag out the steps and it would auto adjust the grid that might be later on down the road mm -hmm. just because it's going to be a lot more challenging on the UI side and to uh, be able to account for uh, different step lengths in the same sequence. So. Well, that definitely sounds really cool. That's something to look forward to for sure. All right, so um, I think we're getting pretty close. We're, we've, I originally said about 30 minutes or so, and we're, we're pushing an hour that we've been chatting here. Uh, but this is, I'm telling you, this has been a blast for me, and I, I'm really excited. I, I think that the, uh, the community is going to love to be able to hear uh, your story and, and hear about what went into this. Um, I hope I'm right, at least. So I, I do want to kind of close here with, uh, you know, is there anything else that, that just something that you want to say to – the uh, the iOS music community. Uh, you're very active uh, on Facebook in the groups, um, it, which is very cool for a developer to be in there like that. Uh, but is there anything that you just want to say to the community as a whole, um, you know, from all developers or from you specifically, or, you know, what do you want us to do? What do you want us to know? Well, First, I wanted to say it's just it's been an amazing sort of journey. Like even from when I first started uh, developing and uh, got Glitch Core out, to be able to find these pockets of uh, of users. So a lot of the big places like the Audio Bus forums, and I see a lot of the same people in different places. But the Audio Bus forums and the groups on Facebook and even uh, groups on Reddit and the Discord channels uh, that I see, I, I see some of the same faces. But the 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 way that people act and behave in these groups is it's been great like if you if you've seen other online communities and the, all the drama that follows there's <laughs> this this certain uh like kinmanship and like camaraderie from i can't say the word well <laughs> camaraderie i don't you know what i'm trying to say but uh, the, the certain love that everybody has for each other and looks out for each other and gives tips and, and tricks and and loves to share what they're doing and uh, gets excited about when apps come out and everybody gets excited and it's just not a lot of negativity that that happens um, i just want to say kudos to to everybody that that makes these communities like a, a welcoming place for both new users and uh, people that are like the developers themselves and other other users that are out there and just looking for more advanced information it's just it's a place that you can go to and find this stuff without having to deal with drama and also as a developer there's uh, in other industries and uh, the developers out there uh, a lot of developers won't visit these forums and uh, because especially like uh, like the games and like video games industry uh, a lot of internet users as you know don't have filters and they just will uh, uh, scare away developers from visiting these places but it's nice that these communities that have sprung up make developers feel welcome and it's nice to be able to have this sort of conversation with with users and uh, content creators. It's, it's really good. So for, first and foremost, there's that. As far as uh, iOS music creation, I, I just love where it's where it's at, where it's going. Uh, it's uh, I know it's changing uh, as we move away from in wrap audio and get to AUV3. I know there's some growing pains in some of the devices that we get, but but it, it's the uh, uh, energy around these particular devices is just overwhelming uh, as far as how uh, how people uh, create with them and and uh, just do just amazing things with just your phone or, or an iPad. It's like nothing else. So I just. I just want to say I, I'm just really happy to be developing on this platform and just hearing what everybody else creates. That's another thing is I, I love to listen to what uh, the users that use my apps and other apps create and, and share with these communities. If we can keep 
keep that going. It's just, I, I have something new to listen to almost every day when I start looking through different forums and different uh, Facebook groups and stuff. So I just want to say a big thank you to all of the users out there that are keeping these things going and all the developers that are making these great apps. Well, and you know, from the the user community, thank you. I mean, it's it, Glitch Core is a fantastic app. It's it's been so much fun to have something new to play with, and you know, you could have made Glitch Core fifteen dollars and people would have bought it, but you made it four dollars, and you know it, that it helped the popularity so much, and it helps people like you know me that. Uh, you know, teach for a living and don't just have bukus of money laying around to spend on apps and do it as more of a hobby to, you know, throwing $4 at, an, at a new app is nothing. Um, and it's just super cool to have that out there and, and have apps like that, that we can do this. And for a developer, you know, the other side of, of being comfortable going into the community, I love seeing the developers, developers in the community and, and talking to users and interacting with users. Um, it's great. It, it lets us know that, you know, you made glitch break because it's something you wanted to perform with. And you took that idea and put it into glitch core because you're using iPad music and you wanted to be able to do that. And it's, it's cool for us to know that, you know, this isn't coming from some faceless corporation that's just trying to sell, you know, a, another replica of candy crush. This is people that actually, I just called out candy crush and somebody's going to come after me for that. But you know, this is an app that was developed by somebody who loves music and loves electronic music and is a real person, a real performer that we can call and say, Hey, you know, how do you use this or whatever? And your responsiveness and, and willing to chat uh, is absolutely great. And thank you very much. And I also want to echo what you said about the community. That's something that I've wanted to talk about uh, a lot is just getting into iOS music a few months ago and seeing the community and started kind of posting some videos and this is kind of what I'm doing. Here's my process. And just the, the feedback I've gotten from that has been amazing. Uh, people are so excited about it and you know, I'm never going to have, you know, four and a half million followers or I may never even reach a thousand subscribers on YouTube. But the fact that, you know, 225 people right now are watching my videos and, and subscribing to it is super cool. And everybody that uh, comments, it has been super positive. There's not, you know, you don't get the people, you know, calling you a noob and telling you to get good and, and all that stuff. It's everybody is really supportive. Um, and I appreciate that uh, very, very much. I also, to echo that, uh, what you said about creating music and posting music, I mean, it is super cool to see what everybody else is doing. And I would tell all the viewers out there and everybody in, in the iOS uh, Facebook groups, post your music. You know, it's so easy to record your screen on an iPad um, and, and just fiddle around in, in AUM for a little while and then post what you've done. I have found that if people aren't interested in it, they just won't watch it, but they're not going to, you know, make fun of you or anything for it. Uh, everybody has been super positive. And most of the time there's at least a few people that say, Hey, that's really cool. That's something I hadn't thought about before. Um, and that's, it's just really satisfying as a musician to know that people are listening and interested in what you're doing. So that's I could awesome. rail on and on and about that for another hour or so, but um, we've got families to get to. So uh, Alex, thank you so much for joining us here. I really appreciate it. And uh, where can we find you on, on the internets? Uh, do you have a, a fan page or a developer page or something on Facebook that we can look at or, you know, whatever? I, well, I have a, I have a website. Uh, I, I, I do have a glitch breaks page on Facebook. I also have glitchbreaks.com, but uh, my main developer site is matthewsound.net. So you can find me there. That's probably where you're going to see most of my new apps. Um, I do have one other app that I didn't mention it is Sliver. So if you if you like uh, glitch flakes and glitch core, just check out Sliver. It's iPad only, but it, it does uh, similar things more on the uh, soundscape granular side. But but yeah, you can go check out information about my apps there. And uh, yeah, it's pretty much if, if you want to follow me on Twitter or if you want to catch me on uh, Distraub, it's D I S T R A U B on Twitter. Uh, as far as on Facebook, I usually post an iPad musician and, uh, and iPhone musician and the AU V3 uh, groups all the time. So I'm there as me, Alex Matthew. So find me on there. And yeah, I would love to get uh, any feedback you guys have, any uh, questions at all. Feel free to contact me. I'm, I'm here. 
cool. Well, thank you again. We'll post links to all those, uh, to your website and, and all your stuff on Facebook in the uh, description of the YouTube channel and on the comments on Facebook so that you can, uh, everybody knows where to find you. Great. Thanks very much. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure.